Storage is a very important part of fault tolerance. If something were to happen to a company's data, such as a disk failure that results in data loss, then that could have a serious impact on how the company performs. That is why we need to make sure that if a disk does fail, no data loss will occur. One of the best ways to prevent data loss is RAID. RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. In a RAID setup, the data is copied onto multiple disks, so that in the event of a disk failure, no data would be lost. There are four common types of RAID. There are RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 10. Now RAID 0 is not fault tolerant. RAID 0 shouldn't even be called RAID because not only does it not provide fault tolerance, it actually increases the chance for data loss. Because in a RAID 0, the data is not duplicated, but it's actually spread or striped across two separate disks. So, if just one of these disks fails, then all the data would be lost. So the only reason why you would want to use RAID 0 is speed. Because when you have two disk controllers working instead of one, then accessing data is much faster. RAID 1 is fault tolerant. In a RAID 1 setup, the data is copied on more than one disk. So disk 2 would have the exact same copy of the data as disk 1. So, in the event of a single disk failure, then no data loss would happen because the other disk would have a duplicate copy. Next, we'll talk about RAID 5. In order to use RAID 5, you need to have three or more disks. RAID 5 is probably the most common setup that is used because it's fast and can store a large amount of data. So in a RAID 5 setup, data is not duplicated, but it's striped or spread across multiple disks. And in addition to the data, there is another very important piece of information that is being evenly spread across all the disks. And this information is called parity and parity is used to rebuild the data in the event of a disk failure. But there is a downside to RAID 5. Because since the equivalent of an entire disk is used to store parity, it reduces the collective amount of data that can be stored in this array. So for instance, if all four of these disks were one terabyte each, that totals four terabytes. But in a RAID 5 setup, the total amount that would be used for data storage would be 3 terabytes because the equivalent of one entire disk would be used to store parity. Now we have to talk about RAID 10. RAID 10 is basically what the name says. It is combining RAID 1 and RAID 0 together, and you need to use a minimum of four disks. In a RAID 10 setup, a set of two disks are mirrored using a RAID 1 setup. Then, both sets of the two disks are striped using RAID 0. So, a RAID 10 setup benefits from the fault tolerance of RAID 1 and the speed of RAID 0. But the downside in a RAID 10 is that you can only use 50% of the capacity for your storage. So if you're using four disks in a RAID 10 setup, you can only use two of them for actual storage. This is the RJ11 connector, and RJ stands for Registered Jack. This is a four-wire connector used mainly to connect telephone equipment. But as far as networking, the RJ11 is used to connect computers to local area networks through the computer's modem. The RJ11 locks itself into place by a single locking tab, and it resembles an RJ45, but it's a little bit smaller. 
The RJ45 is by far the most common network connector. This is an 8-wire connector used to connect computers to local area networks. And like the RJ11, it also locks itself into place by a single locking tab. And it also resembles an RJ11, but it's a little bit larger. The BNC connector is a common type of RF connector that is used on coaxial cable. BNC stands for Bayonet Neal Consulman. And it is used for both analog and digital video transmissions, as well as audio. This connector is called the F-type. This is a threaded connector typically used on coaxial cables. These are primarily used by cable providers to attach to cable modems. The F-type hand tightens by an attached nut. This is the IEE-1394 connector, also known as FireWire. FireWire is recognized by its D-shape. This type of connection is becoming more popular on desktops and laptops and is commonly associated with attaching peripheral devices such as digital cameras and printers, rather than being used as network connections. These are also found in many types of video and multimedia devices. This is a USB connector. The USB is very common on desktops and laptops. Many manufacturers make wireless network cards that plug into a USB port. The USB has two different connector types, Type A and Type B. We also have the USB Mini and USB Micro. A newer type of interface for attaching external peripherals is called Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is a high-speed technology interface that outputs one serial signal from a combination of PCI Express and DisplayPort. Thunderbolt was released in 2011 and was mainly used in Apple products and has now become available to PCs. There are three different versions of Thunderbolt. Versions 1 and 2 use the same connector as a mini display port, and Type 3 uses a USB Type-C connector. Another type of connector is called RCA. The RCA is an older connector that was produced back in the 1940s, and these were primarily used to carry video and audio signals. A lot of times, you may see RCA connectors in groups of three. A yellow, a white, and a red, where the white and red are used for audio, such as a left and right speaker, and the yellow would be used for video. The next fiber optic connector is called the ST or straight tip. This uses a half-twist bayonet type of lock, and is commonly used with single-mode fiber optic cable. And our next connector is called the LC, or local connector. This is also a fiber optic connector. It uses a jack similar to the RJ45. This type of connector is commonly used between floors in a building. Our last fiber optic connector is called the SC, or standard connector. And this uses a push-pull connector similar to audio and video plugs. And like the LC connector, this is also commonly used between floors in a building. The term plenum refers to a space in a building where there is open airflow circulation. This is usually between the drop ceiling and the structure ceiling. Buildings that don't have plenum spaces have air ducts encapsulating the airflow. So, as a result, 
Buildings that have plenum spaces where there is adequate open airflow are more prone to fires than buildings that don't have plenum spaces. And because of this, cables that run through plenum spaces must meet certain requirements. First, they must be more fire resistant. Secondly, they must not produce any toxic fumes if they are burned. Sometimes there might be cases in your home or office where you want a certain computer in a certain part of the building to be able to access the internet or to be networked. And for whatever reason, network cabling or Wi-Fi just wasn't an option in that part of the building. Maybe because of difficulties in the structure of the building or interference or whatever, so another 1901 standard gave the ability to network using the existing electrical system of the building. Ethernet over power line gives the ability of Ethernet networking over power. So for instance, let's say you needed this computer up here to be able to access the internet, but for some reason you can't get any network cables or any Wi-Fi signal to reach that computer. In this case, we're going to use Ethernet over power, so we're going to need a couple of power line adapters like these. These power line adapters plug directly into a power outlet, and they have a built-in Ethernet port for an RJ45 connector. So one of them plugs into the power outlet next to this computer up here, and then you would connect an Ethernet cable from the network port of the computer, and the other end into the power line adapter's Ethernet port. Then, the other adapter plugs into the power outlet next to the modem or router down here, and you would plug an Ethernet cable from the modem or router to the power line adapter. Now, Ethernet data would use the building's electrical wiring to deliver networking data to the other power line adapter so that the other computer can access the Internet. This video is part of our full CompTIA A-plus course, which can be found in the description.